the sounds and images of Pope John Paul II's jubilee pilgrimage to the Holy Land in March of the year 2000 remain indelibly etched in the minds of those who took part in this historic visit and those who followed closely on their television screens around the world. There was no doubt that this was a deeply moving event for Christians and Jews the world over. We are very excited to be in Jerusalem when the Pope is there. I think this is a great moment in history. He wants peace for all nations. I'm really happy he came. He's come in peace. From the human point of view, and from the religious point of view, it has been the greatest experience in my life. While Pope John Paul II's pilgrimage to the Holy Land was an exceptional personal journey, it was also the climax of another journey which has lasted for half a century. The journey of the Catholic Church to recognition of and reconciliation with the Jewish people. Each stop on Pope John Paul's week-long visit to the Holy Land was carefully planned. To appreciate the historic significance of this pilgrimage, one must go back in history. The history of Catholic-Jewish relations for most of our history was very negative. It was a story of uh, persecutions and pogroms and uh, Jews were uh, on the bad end of it most of the time, and particularly the Middle Ages, throughout the Crusades. I think it was a pretty sad history. What happened in this century post-Holocaust is rather remarkable. If I had to summarize the changes between Catholics and Jews, I would say we've moved from persecution to partnership, from confrontation to cooperation. This is a story of self-examination and soul-searching. While Pope John Paul II's visit is the most well-publicized example of this change in our day, the journey began with Pope John XXIII, known by his actions as the Good Pope. It was Pope John XXIII who set in motion the monumental shift in attitudes toward the Jewish people and the Jewish faith. His wartime experiences influenced his later actions. Serving as Papal Nuncio in Turkey during the Second World War, Monsignor Roncalli was involved in the rescue of thousands of Jews from extermination by the Nazis. When Roncalli succeeded Pope Pius XII in 1958, he became known as Pope John XXIII. During his term, he initiated a revolution in the Catholic Church. In 1962, 8,000 Catholic bishops from around the globe were called together to discuss issues of relevance to the Church in facing the modern world. This would be called the Second Vatican Council, and part of its task was to reassess the attitude of the Church toward non-Christian religions. One of the great graces of my life was to have been a participant as uh, an advisor present at the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council. And I will never forget the day when, and it was in 19... 63, when Cardinal Augustine Bea came before the council to present what evolved in time into the document called Nostra Aetate in our day on the relationship between the Catholic Church and non-Christian religions. In Nostra Aetate, the rethinking about Judaism was specifically articulated. It was here that the foundations of recognition and reconciliation were laid. A fateful meeting between Pope John XXIII and the famous French Jewish historian Jules Isaac had a great impact on the Pope. Pope John XXIII, as he was preparing for the Second Vatican Council, expressly invited the great um, French Jewish historian Jules Isaac to the Vatican. Said, uh, I want to know, uh, what, what are you looking for? Uh, how can we help that we're going to be engaging the modern world in the Second Vatican Council? And uh, Jules Isaac was prepared, as he, a good historian, with a whole list of, of things which have since become known as the teaching of contempt. 
how Christians have taught about the Jews and Judaism, and uh, he presented them in this list, and Pope John the 23rd looked at the list and studied it, and he said, you can expect more than a little from us. Over our, our history as Christians, we've never been able to speak of ourselves without speaking about Judaism, because it's from uh, Judaism that, that we came. But unfortunately, really tragically, we see now in retrospect, that those early years when we were trying to develop our own identity, that there was this teaching about the other that always reduced the other to something less than we were. In the Middle Ages, that was uh, shown particularly, because in the Middle Ages, most people uh, were not literate, at least in any sense that we have it today. So that was shown by way of comparison, contrast, and various modes of art. Uh, two of the most famous figures from the Middle Ages uh, are these two figures, two women, of the church and the synagogue, synagoga and ecclesia. Uh, but the, the most famous, I suppose, would be in the Cathedral of Strasbourg, France. And there, uh, the, the church is always presented as a woman who is elegant and upright, queenly, I, I, I would say, uh, representing the triumph of the risen Christ. Uh, in contrast, uh, the woman who is representative of the synagogue of the people of Israel is shown as beaten down, as defeated, the crown is falling off her head, the staff is broken, and so forth. And clearly then, for people in the Middle Ages, when they viewed those sculptures, they knew exactly where the church stood in relationship to Judaism. So it's a visualization of the teaching of contempt. The meeting between Pope John XXIII and Jules Isaac set the stage for the formal changes which were to come out of the Second Vatican Council regarding relations toward Judaism and the Jewish people. Hints of the changing tides can be recognized at another encounter that took place between Pope John XXIII and a delegation of American Jews on the eve of the Second Vatican Council. He came in the midst of the usual Vatican decorum and regality. He came into the room and he said, I am Joseph, your brother. And from that moment, I think we can see the beginning of a trajectory that I think has gone straight through the pontificates of John the 23rd, Paul the 6th, and Pope John Paul the 2nd. Welcoming the Jewish delegation with the phrase, I am Joseph, your brother, was particularly apt because Pope John XXIII's given name was Giuseppe, Joseph in Italian. By using the biblical story of Joseph as a metaphor, the Pope established a familial bond with the Jewish delegation that would help to open the new chapter in Catholic-Jewish relations. No longer were Jews to be seen as the killers of Jesus, but rather, Jews and Christians were to be seen now as family, as brothers and sisters. Joseph's story is um, it actually is one of my favorite uh, stories. Joseph the alienated brother, alienated from his own brothers who were very cruel to him. They sold him into slavery and he went into Egypt. When the brothers and the father were suffering from a famine, they heard that there was food in Egypt, so they sent them down to uh, Egypt and apparently Joseph recognized his brothers. Sometimes Joseph is registering surprise when he is confronting his brothers. Sometimes he is saying, I am Joseph, your brother, in a consoling way. But I find it to be a wonderful description of one of our faith groups saying to the other, uh, interchangeably, that we are brothers. And so finally, near the end of the story, Joseph says, I'm Joseph, your brother. And so there's the moment of uh, great uh, reconciliation. The declaration in Nostra Etate regarding the Jews is a formal articulation of this familial bond. In effect, Nostra Etate dramatically changed the relationship of the Catholic Church to the Jewish people. Nostra Aetate abolished any basis for the popular idea that Jews collectively were responsible for deicide or for the death of God in killing Christ. Uh, 
Uh, what Vatican II said, uh, not that uh, we should no longer blame Jews for that, but in fact said there was no reason to blame them in the first place. When, and it was in 1963, when Cardinal Augustine Bea came before the council, and he said, I'm speaking in accord with the wish of Pope John XXIII, who died the previous June, but he wished that this document, this idea, be presented to the council so that we could make sure that our church would do everything possible to keep Christian scriptures and Christian teachings from being misunderstood and used as an excuse for anti-Semitism or worse. Like, so that what the terrible things that happened under the Nazis in the Holocaust would never happen again. The holy city of Jerusalem, the cradle of the three monotheistic faiths, the capital of the state of Israel today, Jerusalem is the meeting place where people of all faith traditions converge, inspired by the past and challenged by the present. In this place, where the intense beauty of the city strikes the visitor, the text and collective histories of the different faiths come alive. For the Christian community, the old city of Jerusalem is particularly meaningful. Here, on the Via Dolorosa, the Way of the Cross, pilgrims come to commemorate the last journey of Jesus to the crucifixion. At the second station on this path stands the convent of Ecce Homo, where it is believed that the condemnation of Jesus by Pontius Pilate took place. The name of the convent is taken from the words spoken under the arch by Roman Governor Pilate. Ecce Homo, behold the man. Among the rich archaeological remains under the Ecce Homo lies an ancient Roman road where visitors encounter the historical roots of the life of Jesus. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priest and their officials saw him, they shouted, but Pilate answered, but Pilate answered you, take you take him and crucify him. him. As, for As for me, I find no basis. Find no basis. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. When I hear things like texts saying the Jews killed Jesus and the Jews responded, kill him, kill him, the main thing that I think is how necessary it is to give Christians a good interpretation of these texts. I remember living in Rome for a few years and hearing the passion story in Rome and thinking, why has no one ever said all the Romans killed Jesus? Walking in the Holy Land, it is possible to imagine Jesus in the context of his day. The emphasis that we uh, focus on as far as the teaching is that the Jewish roots of our, of our Christian tradition, of our Catholic tradition, so that therefore we make sure that the Jewish traditions are also taught and that there is some understanding of that. Because as Sisters of Sign, our focus since Vatican II is very much to build bridges to be reconcilers, to break down prejudices, especially anti-Semitism, but any kind of prejudices. It really shows us how very interconnected we are, that we don't even know who we are if we don't know um, anything about Judaism or about the Jewish people. And not only that, when we say that Jesus was Jewish, he's still Jewish. <laughs> and we need to teach that. If, if we believe in the resurrection, and Jesus is resurrected, he's still Jewish. Maybe Jewish people don't need to be related uh, to Christians, but we absolutely, in order to understand who we are, need to be related to, the, to Jews and to the Jewish tradition. 
The atmosphere of the Second Vatican Council opened the door to a new process of dialogue which continues to this day. Um, I think since the Second Vatican Council, the Roman Catholic Church has taken the lead in terms of redefining itself vis-a-vis -vis the Jewish people. That has very far-reaching implications for how Protestants should reconceptualize who they are and how they are to be in the world as well. The Jewish community established the International Jewish Committee for Interreligious Consultations to represent Jewish views worldwide in the dialogue process with their Catholic counterpart, the Pontifical Commission on Religious Relations with the Jews. The Jews who were active in the dialogue from the 60s on had to respond to the openings in the Catholic Church. Uh, and basically, uh, almost everything was on the table. Uh, from the Catholic side, there was a great interest in education, uh, learning about liturgy, uh, coming to grips with their own past, particularly anti-Semitism, later on Holocaust, later on the State of Israel. So I think first was a lot of listening. Jews were listening, learning uh, what the Catholic Church was doing and trying to figure out um, many uh, ways to respond. We, I think, as, as, a, as a people, as a history, are uh, partially uh, can't believe that people, are, after centuries of being uh, persecuted, cannot, you know, have to first build up enough trust to believe that this dialogue is real and not for missionary purposes or not for purposes of uh, annihilation. So we have our own history to get over. But I believe certainly uh, Jews living in the Western world today understand that it's not just important, it's vital. It's uh, uh, to, to speak and to get to know each other and to respect one another and to uh, make space for one another. The spring holiday season of Passover and Easter was historically a most volatile time in Jewish-Christian relations. Many believe that the Last Supper of Jesus with his disciples was in fact a Passover Seder. Throughout the Middle Ages, the reenactment of the death of Jesus in Passion Plays stirred the crowds to rioting and persecution of the local Jewish population. The blood libel that came tragically out of Christian quarters, was overwhelmingly associated with Passover. The, the, I mean, for us today, the most ridiculous, it appears, myth was unfortunately genuinely believed by people that Jews have some interest or need to kill a Christian child and somehow transform that flesh into unleavened bread and they drink the blood as the wine. God of our fathers, bring us to future feasts and festivals in peace and to the upbuilding of your city. At the Passover the Seder, Jews city. recount the story of the Exodus from Egypt. Young and old alike participate in celebrating this holiday of freedom. Toward the end of the Seder, the front door is open to welcome Elijah the prophet, who heralds the Messianic age. A symbolic glass of wine is poured for this guest. In Christian Europe, the opening of the door was also an invitation to the non-Jewish neighbors to see that, in fact, there was no unsavory activity transpiring, no blood being spilled. It was a Jewish response to the blood libel charge. In some homes, white wine, rather than red, was used to dispel suspicion. These traditions continue to this day, even though the historical context has radically changed. If you went to a Catholic service on Good Friday, 1950, you would hear a prayer where we said, usually in Latin, but then if it was translated for the people, uh, we would pray for the perfidious Jews. Now that's a, a transliteration of the word perfidii, which means simply the unbelieving. But as we know in English, perfidious means hateful or, or bad. Beginning with the papacy of Pius XII, the word perfidious in the Easter liturgy was addressed and later removed completely. I had just entered the convent. And I remember in the Good Friday service, he just simply took the word perfidious out of the, out of the liturgy, which 
which was atrocious to have in, in the liturgy describing why we pray for the Jews. And I, I remember thinking how powerful, one, just one stroke and that was erased. Now what we pray on Good Friday is, we pray that the Jews will be faithful to the call of God as they hear it. What an incredible difference in 30 years between the perfidious Jews to the Jews will be faithful to the call of God as they hear it. The old images of the teaching of contempt, of anti-Semitism and blood libel charges have been negated by many of Pope John Paul II's actions. His 1986 visit to Rome's Great Synagogue confirmed that a new relationship had indeed begun. This was the first visit of a Pope in all recorded history to a synagogue, an act all the more remarkable when you understand the Jewish experience in Rome. The Arch of Titus, located in the center of the Roman Forum, visually presents the destruction of the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. The image of the candelabra being removed from the temple by the Roman legion became a symbol of Jewish dispersion and wandering for 2,000 years. Until the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948, Jews adopted the custom not to walk beneath the arch. Historically, this was a symbol of Jewish humiliation and servitude. With the inauguration of each new pope throughout the Middle Ages, the chief rabbi of Rome, subservient and on foot, was required to hold out a Torah scroll for the new pontiff to touch as he passed through the arch in his carriage. The visit of Pope John Paul II to the Great Synagogue can be seen in sharp contrast to the medieval imagery. As the chief rabbi and the pope sat together, level and eye to eye, Pope John Paul II, in his own words, reiterated the sentiments expressed earlier by Pope John XXIII. The Jewish religion is not extrinsic to us, but in a certain way it is intrinsic to our own religion. With Judaism, therefore, we have a relationship, which we do not have with any other religion. You are our dearly beloved brothers, and in a certain way it could be said that you are our elder brother. One of the most significant moments of my career in Rome was the visit of Pope John Paul II to the synagogue. When I first received the Pope's request to visit our synagogue, I understood that the visit would have serious implications. I consulted with other rabbis in Europe, and we agreed to accept the Pope's initiative. The visit went smoothly. When we approached the Holy Ark, everyone applauded. Down the street from the synagogue, walking through what remains of the medieval Jewish ghetto in Rome, one is struck by the Hebrew and Latin inscription on the church of St. Gregorio. In that church, and in others which surrounded the ghetto, Jews were forced to hear the Sermon of Conversion at Sunday Mass. Only through conversion to Christianity could their sins be corrected. Forced baptisms were common, and Jews lived in fear. The inscription above the entrance to the church is taken from the Hebrew Scriptures. I have extended my hand every day to a rebellious people that went along a bad path following their whims. The use of this selection from the prophet Isaiah is a constant reminder of the traditional attitude of the church to the Jewish people. Many people don't believe the problems for the Jews during the ghetto period. It's important, this description. It's a document. The image of Pope John Paul II in the year 2000 at the Western Wall in Jerusalem conveyed a moving message. The Western Wall is what remains of the Holy Temple destroyed by the Romans as seen in the Arch of Titus. The Western Wall is the symbol of the rebirth of the Jewish people in their historical homeland. By honoring the Western Wall with a prayer, the Catholic Church has completed its public repudiation of the teaching of contempt.
saddened by the behavior of those who in the course of history have caused those children of yours to suffer. And asking forgiveness, we wish to commit ourselves to genuine brotherhood with the people of the covenant. In order to understand the significance of John Paul II's visit in the year 2000, we must examine the changes in the attitude of the Vatican toward the return of the Jewish people to their homeland. Well, I would focus uh, to look for an image upon the famous encounter between Theodor Herzl, the visionary of modern political Zionism and of modern Israeli statehood, with uh, Pope Pius X, as Herzl records it in his diaries. And he was plodding around Europe trying to enlist the leadership of political leadership of Europe in his enterprise for the reestablishment of a Jewish national homeland in its ancestral place of origin. Theodore Herzl was invited to an official audience with Pope Pius X in 1904. In his diary entry for that day, Herzl recorded the Pope's response to his request. We cannot give approval to this movement. We cannot prevent the Jews from going to Jerusalem, but we could never sanction it. The Jews have not recognized our Lord, therefore we cannot recognize the Jewish people. And so if you come to Palestine and settle your people there, we shall have churches and priests ready to baptize all of you. On May 14, 1948, the establishment of the State of Israel was declared by David Ben-Gurion, Israel's first Prime Minister. The Jewish people, both in Israel and around the world, celebrated this moment as the fulfillment of Jewish aspirations to return to their homeland. The majority of the nations of the world community had already approved the creation of the Jewish state in a vote taken at the United Nations on November 29th of the year before. For the Vatican, it took almost 50 years to establish formal relations with the Jewish state. When Pope John XXIII died in 1963, he was succeeded by Pope Paul VI. In 1964, this Pope made the first papal visit ever outside Europe. His destination was the Holy Land, the birthplace of Christianity. He traveled to the holy sites and visited Catholic communities in the region. Pope Paul VI's visit to Israel was an intentionally, almost demonstrably, non-state visit. He just came in almost through the back door to visit certain Christian sites, or sites of significance for Christianity. And when he left uh, Israel, uh, he sent a telegram, and in that telegram, as previously in all his statements, he didn't even mention the name of the State of Israel. And in retrospect, the feeling in Israel was one of having received a slap in the face, certainly not of having been accorded its full dignity. The church no longer sees the Jewish destiny as one of wandering and punishment for rejecting Jesus. If Vatican II erased the theological obstacle described by Herzl in his diaries, why was official recognition of the state put off for so long? is a very frequent question. There has been frequent and important contacts between the Holy See and Israel also before the official recognition. I remember that when I was here as a secretary, the then Prime Minister Golda Meir went to pay a visit to the Vatican. I would not say official visit. As soon the three peoples of the region, Israel, Palestinian and Jordan, they recognize each other, immediately the Holy See established relations with Israel, with Jordan, and in uh, some not yet complete way with the Palestinian. It was due to the political, local political situation that there were not yet 
till 94 diplomatic relations. With the establishment of these formal relations, Israel appointed its first ambassador to the Vatican. Being in the Vatican is like being in, uh, in another planet for me as a diplomat. When I met the Pope for the first time, you know, I entered the Vatican uh, through the, uh, the main door with a Swiss guard and the first Israeli who lived this experience. Uh, and I told the, uh, the Pope that uh, for me, really, it's a very, very great moment. And his uh, response was, uh, you know, this is an historical moment for all of us. In 1995, to mark the 30th anniversary of the Nostra Etate, the Israeli delegation in the presence of Vatican officials planted an olive tree from Israel in the Vatican gardens, echoing the words of the document. Thus the Church draws sustenance from the root of that well-cultivated olive tree onto which have been grafted the wild shoots, the Gentiles. Cultivating this relationship in the political turmoil of our time is one of the continuing challenges facing both sides of this diplomatic accord. Holocaust Memorial Day in Israel. When the siren sounds, the country comes to a halt. Though over half a century has passed since the Second World War, Israel, home to the largest number of Holocaust survivors and their families, commemorates this day every year with prayer and ceremonies. This is the official day to remember a terrible period in the history of mankind, a period in which six million Jewish human beings, men, women, and children, were persecuted dehumanized and murdered by the Nazis and their collaborators in Europe. The visit of Pope John Paul II to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem, will be remembered as one of the most moving moments of his pilgrimage. His personal experiences, growing up in Poland before and during World War II, influenced the young seminarian who was later to become Pope John Paul II. It provided him with personal connections to the Jewish people and a strong feeling of identification with their suffering during the Shoah. This is Edith Tsira, born in Poland. During the war, she was sent to a labor camp where she remained until liberation. After the war, she was found by a young priest who carried her to the train station to join other survivors. This priest later became the Pope, John Paul II. While the Holocaust has understandably been a watershed in the Jewish experience, members of the Church too are grappling with its meaning today. Uh, what I mean by uh, the Holocaust, the show, as part of our history is that uh, sometimes you'll hear Christians say, well, that's Jewish history, as if the victims are the only part of what makes it history, but the perpetrators and the bystanders were overwhelmingly baptized Christians. Whether they were practicing or not, they were baptized Christians. And therefore, it's our history. And we have to account in our own history of why this happened in a Christian country. And that's why it's our history. In March of 1998, the Vatican's Commission on Religious Relations with the Jews published a document entitled, We Remember, a Reflection on the Shoah. Inspired by Pope John Paul II and the product of years of deliberation within the Vatican, the document directs Catholics to contemplate the actions of Christians in Europe during the terrible years of the Holocaust. Although some Jewish organizations felt that the document was not far-reaching enough, there was no denying that the Catholic Church had begun seriously to examine its role in the Shoah. The feeling was uh, that the Shoah would not have happened had not the Church taken that very strong uh, stand against Jews down through the centuries and created what we called anti-Judaism, a form of anti-Semitism, by which we consider the Jews to have been responsible 
for the death of our Lord on the cross, whether they were Jews at that time or since. I think the main message that needs to be communicated to Catholic students at all levels, but particularly those in theological schools, is in fact, uh, in the first instance, that the church failed to a certain extent, maybe to a great extent, morally during this period, that some of this moral failure was due directly to the historic uh, teachings which, of the church which regarded Jews and Judaism in a very negative light. In the Catholic schools of the Diocese of Patterson, New Jersey, eighth grade students tackle the issues of the church and its relationship to the Holocaust in a structured curriculum taught throughout the diocese. Christians blamed the Jewish people for being a God killer, correct? All right, and through the centuries, what were some of the ways in which Christians treated Jews? Larissa? Um, they'd separate them into different parts of where they live, just like they did in the ghettos. The Catholic history, we have to learn about what we did, and we have to know that, like, we shouldn't do it again. So in the future, when we grow up, we won't we won't treat the Jews like that, or we won't treat anyone else like that. It is a tragedy the church needs to remember on account of her members' part in it, and especially in view of the close relationship between Christianity and Judaism. Failure to remember can lead to a minimizing of the Shoah and even a denial that the tragedy ever took place. Are there people that deny? Yeah. In Toronto, Canada, Eighth graders at a Jewish day school are also learning about the Holocaust. The issue of the righteous Gentiles, those non-Jews who tried to rescue Jewish victims, is part of their curriculum. Once Jen was being sent off in the train and um, uh, Schindler went after him. What is the name, the term given to a person like Oscar Schindler who helped the Jews? Righteous Gentiles. Correct. Righteous Gentiles. Um, were there many? No. That's true. Comparatively speaking, in terms of as Jews, when we think about the Holocaust and the loss that Jews suffered, you're right. There were not enough righteous Gentiles. One of the major moral dilemmas confronting those who study the Holocaust is the issue of why so few people stretched out their hands to save Jewish lives at a time of such darkness. When I, when I passed the trees, of the righteous here at Yad Vashem, I thought of how much these people contributed, how difficult it must have been, and how grateful I am that they provided some measure of hope, some measure of moral courage in an era of great moral darkness. They give me some hope. I wonder as well what I would have done and whether I would have had the courage that they showed, because it was so easy to find reasons not to show courage. Uh, ten years ago, we created a Garden of the Righteous here at the synagogue. And every year, we bring a non-Jew from Europe or from other parts of the United States, representing a different part of Europe, to honor and to be recognized by the congregation, because I want the children to know that there are good non-Jews in the world who did very righteous things, uh, and daring things on behalf of Jews, people who, often whom they did not know. And these are exemplars for us, and we must learn to live by that same standard. Pope John Paul II's papacy has been noted for its symbolic gestures of reconciliation with the Jewish people, including the We Remember document and his historic trips to Auschwitz, Babi Yar, and Yad Vashem. In contrast, the papacy of Pius XII, the wartime pope, is a point of contention between the Jewish community and the Catholic Church. I'm prepared to say that Pius did not make saving Jewish life uh, a priority, and I'm prepared to critique him morally for that failure. I'm not quite prepared on the available data to say this was simply a callous disregard. There were those in the Jewish community who expressed appreciation and gratitude to Pius XII 
for the role he played during the war. However, with the publication of The Deputy, written by West German author Rolf Hochut in 1963, some began to question the Pope's lack of vigorous public protest in the face of Nazism. And I have friends who hold the church guilty. They believe that the Holocaust could have been impeded, maybe even stopped, had the popes, certainly Pope Pius, been more forthright, more daring, more determined, had he spoken out, regardless of what it would have cost the church. And they will never forgive the Catholic Church for ha not having spoken out at the time. Well, I think the, the very term silence is, is problematic in, in a lot of ways. Uh, there was a policy of public neutrality in European wars uh, that, that the Vatican had and held to through the war, but he wasn't silent in Christmas of 1942. He, he made a statement uh, condemning attacks on peoples for their um, ethnicity or race. And in Europe at that time, the word race had only one meeting. The New York Times picked that up and praised him. Oh, so I think we need to lower the rhetoric level and begin to appreciate the complexity of the situation faced by Pius XII. After all, this was World War II. The proposed beatification of this wartime pope has caused concern within the Jewish community. From a Jewish perspective, we feel that historically we were let down. Even if the Pope might have not prevented the extermination of six million Jews, at least there could have been the voice of moral succor, which would have been not insignificant under those circumstances. And therefore, at the very least, one would expect that the Catholic Church should delay the question of the beatification, the canonization of Pius XII. The archives of the Vatican house the largest collection of documentation dealing with the history of the Catholic Church. Vatican policy restricts access to these materials for scholarly research. In the atmosphere of dialogue which has been created, Jews and Catholics alike felt that only study of the documents of the wartime period could clarify the record of Pope Pius XII. Our archives are not open, and uh, they have a very strict rule that they don't open for a certain number of years, and um, before they can be, uh, scholars can come in and work in the archives. Holy See, but had published 11 volumes of uh, documents from the uh, period of the Second World War, which would give a pretty good idea of what happened. They were, they were original documents published in their original language, and. I felt anyhow, well, rather than keep on arguing about this, see the archives or not see the archives, when we had no authority to be, allow people to see the archives, and those who did said, no, the rule is such and it will be observed. Um, the, I suggested that, well, look, we have these volumes. What about having a look at them? In 1999, a commission of six historians, three Jewish and three Catholic, was established to study these materials and to prepare a report on their findings. Cardinal Cassidy, the head of the Church's Commission for Relations with the Jews, uh, issued um, a kind of appeal or proposal, I should say, uh, that Jewish scholars and Catholic scholars sit down together and examine these documents, these documents which it has been consistently held over the years ought to put the matter to rest, uh, read these documents together, uh, discuss them, consider them, evaluate them, appraise them, and see if uh, there are any, there were any questions to be raised. If you have, on the one hand, uh, an argument for beatification and canonization, and on the other hand, you have the most uh, uh, forceful condemnation and denunciation of the wartime pope, I think it's fair to say that our preliminary conclusions point to somewhere in between. The issue of access to the additional materials in the Vatican archives remains unresolved. On a personal level, Christians continue to grapple with the legacy of the Holocaust. What happened to me was, um, I didn't know this whole history. I was um, here in Jerusalem, and I walked to the main post office, and a woman grabbed my cross, and she said, get that thing off, I hate it. I couldn't imagine why she hated it. Why would she hate it? And so 
I have a degree in church history and I didn't know that. I didn't know the story of the, of the church and the Jewish people, so I started to study. This is shocking to me. I had not studied the show in my t nearly 20 years of Catholic education. And, uh, and my first answer to how could this have happened, which I think has to confront any Christian, is to say, uh, is to say well, the Christians simply were not Christian enough. They'd only done what Jesus said they wouldn't have killed or allowed to be killed in their presence, their Jewish brothers and sisters. But the easy answer is, is, uh, is not enough. There's a whole history of Jewish, or excuse me, of Christian persecution of Jews that uh, finds its uh, final uh, moment in the, in the Holocaust. And uh, I study that history and that, uh, that I think set the course of my life uh, uh, to saying we have to work for new relations between Jews and Christians because of what we have done to the Jews over 2,000 years, the worst moment, of course, being the Holocaust. Contrary to the older generation, which came to the subject later in life, young Catholics today, students and intellectuals, are studying and struggling with the moral issues of the Holocaust. On the last night at Auschwitz at the Center for Faith and Dialogue, which is located adjacent to the actual concentration camp itself, uh, Auschwitz I, I had the privilege to celebrate the, sh the Shabbat with the Jews that we traveled with from America and Jerusalem, as well as the Germans, the, the Polish people. And that was probably the emotional highlight of the trip because I thought it was incredible that, what, 60, 55 years after this atrocity happened, I have the privilege to sit there with Jews, Christians, uh, Germans, etc., at a table celebrating the Jewish faith and celebrating my own faith. It was like saying, in your face, Hitler. Your, your tour guide tells you uh, a heartbreaking story about a family that's separated at the selection line, and your heart breaks when you hear that one story of one family, and then you think, you know, to really understand what happened here, uh, I have to multiply that story by six million times. Uh, and then when you, you know, when you realize that uh, experience of um, the, the depth of the suffering and the tragedy and the evil that happened there, it poses in a new way the same kinds of questions that you have even before you go about how could this have happened? Uh, why did this happen? How could this have happened um, in a Europe that had been so-called Christianized for over 1,500 years. I think it is in all of our interest to understand more. The truth is that during the Holocaust, no one did enough. No one did enough. I don't know what enough would be. I think it is the job of everyone now, Catholics and Jews, to understand more about the Holocaust period, to understand why no one was really able adequately to deal with this catastrophe in order to go on from here. We pray that our sorrow for the tragedy which the Jewish people has suffered in our century will lead to a new relationship with the Jewish people. We wish to turn awareness of past sins into a firm resolve to build a new future in which there will be no more anti-Judaism among Christians or anti-Christian sentiment among Jews, but a shared mutual respect as befits those who adore the one Creator and Lord and who have a common father in faith, Abraham. The Jewish community's reaction to the We Remember document and the request for shared mutual respect has been mixed. There are those in the community who feel that the relationship is not balanced, and the Church's need to make up for hundreds of years of past sins does not require any Jewish obligation or response. On the other hand, hundreds of rabbis issued and signed a statement in the year 2000 calling to strengthen the dialogue between Jews and Christians. This document is called Dabru Emet, the Hebrew words for speak the truth. We recognize with gratitude those Christians who risked or sacrificed their lives 
to save Jews during the Nazi regime. Dabru Emet is really a document which is directed towards those who have a role in the education of the current and future generations. It's important for both sides to begin this long and painful conversation, but not to dialogue, not to have this conversation, will be to allow the same kind of ignorance to grow, which will allow for the repression of all the positive elements of Vatican documents of church teaching and the suspicion of the other and the one who's different in both communities. Since the Brumet, I have seen more initiatives for serious dialogue than I had seen in the past. And I participated in a dialogue, a public dialogue, at Loyola College under Jewish sponsorship. We talked about the Trinity, which is a distinctly Christian belief, but I believe the discussion was at a level that I would call as, as very constructive. And it would, to me, it was one of the positive signs that we've moved to a new phase in our relationships. First of all, um, I, I'm second generation involved in interfaith dialogue. I grew up in a home where my father was very much involved with the first rounds of interfaith dialogue at the Vatican. And second of all, it's a Jewish tradition, and it might even be a woman's tradition. Um, we're reminded of the first interfaith uh, joint uh, social action was the daughter of Pharaoh and uh, Miriam saving baby Moses. And this was certainly interfaith for the sake of redemption. So I like to think that um, interfaith work can lead to uh, redemptive work and um, saving the oppressed and uh, caring and compassion. I got the idea to have a new synagogue in Ecclesia, ones that would be appropriate for the new theology. So I asked a sculptor friend of mine if she would do these sculptures. And, and of course, the beauty of these sculptures, by the way, is that they can, you know, they can face each other in various and sundry ways. The new synagogue and Ecclesia stand in striking contrast to the classic sculptures from medieval Europe. These new images reflect the revolutionary changes in the Christian-Jewish relationship. Dialogue is not in any way uh, meant towards conversion. Around the world, Jews and Christians, leaders and lay people, are involved in a dialogue process, building bridges between the communities. That there is a real and important distinction between theological dialogue and Christian mission. When I speak of theological dialogue with Jewish representatives, I'm not speaking of unity in faith, but of a dialogue that helps the partners to understand and accept each other as they really are. Because I'm a man of God, if I can use that expression, a believer, a worshiper, a, a servant of God, I'm going to try to love every human being, understand the message of God has revealed to my people and to other people and try to find ways and means of promoting peace and fighting hatred and bloodshed and animosity. It's through a process of education that one is equipped to re-examine those fundamental assumptions about who we are and to scrutinize the assertions about the superiority of Christianity that would lead us to dismiss Judaism as a very dynamic and rich reality that we need to pay attention to if we are to understand our own tradition. The generation born after Vatican II and the Nostra Aetate document takes the new relationship for granted. My dream for interfaith dialogue is for religions to understand how they can work together and in what, in what ways they can be partners with each other towards our shared goals of um, social justice, uh, human rights, um, perfecting the world, to use a Jewish metaphor. Um, we, we share those broad concepts and there are so many ways that we can join forces um, to advocate for, for goodness in the world, for godliness in the world. I was honored to be able to uh, talk with Jews at Auschwitz regarding the Holocaust. Uh, in doing so I learned much about the Jewish religion, about the Jewish people, and I also learned that 
I, as a Christian, need to work with Jews to forge some kind of common understanding. Uh, we don't need to eliminate our differences, but I think we do need to work together to create a world of harmony and understanding with each other. There's a kind of pluralism accepted that you have a path to God, we have a path to God, and we can uh, learn uh, from each other in ways that were simply inconceivable uh, pre uh, this period. Specifically, we will need to make great changes in the future in educating about each other. Just as it would be improper for Catholics to teach about Jews without mentioning the creation of the State of Israel, so too it should be impossible for Jews to teach about Catholics without discussing the changes that have taken place since Vatican II. That after 2,000 years, we in this generation right now have an incredible opportunity to turn around something that it took 2,000 years to mess up. The cleanup has begun and we can now structure the future so that the next certainly thousand years will be much more productive so that for that period Jews and Christians will be able to stand together to address together the problems of the world. This is virtually without precedence after this much animosity for two groups this ancient to turn toward each other and say we have something to say to the world. I would say that uh, during his time as Pope, many changes happened from the side of the Catholic Church toward the Jewish religion and the Jewish people. With courage, with loyalty, the Catholic Church has examined its past. It means also a will to change its future. After their emotional reconciliation, Joseph and his brothers forge a new basis for their relationship. The overtures of reconciliation of the Catholic Church to the Jewish people are identified with the outstanding figures of the last half century. Fulfilling their legacy is the challenge which lies ahead. The preceding program was produced by the Interreligious Coordinating Council in Israel in association with the Catholic Communication Campaign of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. <laughs>